6.4 Exponential and Logarithmic Functions of Arbitrary Bases So in the last lecture we determined that if a was any positive number, any positive real number, we could write a to the x as e raised to the x ln of a and we took that to be our definition for a to the x. So we've actually already defined or given a formula for exponential functions of arbitrary bases. So for example, when we talk about the exponential function 2 to the x, our working definition for that function is e to the x times ln of 2. Similarly, I could say that 1 half to the x would be e to the x times ln of 1 half. And in the last lecture, we reminded ourselves from college algebra that the graph of a to the x when a is greater than 1 will be one of those so-called exponential growth functions. And if the base is less than 1, then the graph would be one of those so-called exponential decay functions. All right, now... This working definition of the exponential function allows us to do two things immediately. Uh, number one is we can now formally prove the power rule from Calc 1. So let's say power rule revisited. So now when I try to take the derivative of x to the r, where again that exponent r is not necessarily just an integer or just a rational number, it could be an irrational number. Our power rule from Calc 1 says that the derivative should be r times x to the r minus 1. The proof of that is now simple based on our new definition. If I take the derivative of x to the r, our formula for a to the x, which is our formula for exponential functions now, says that I should be able to write x to the r as e to the r times ln of x. Check that and make sure that max matches up with our formula. Okay, if that looks right, uh, what did we determine last time? Recall the derivative of e to the u is e to the u times u prime. And when I say u prime, of course, I mean du dx. So in this case, what's the derivative of e to the r times ln of x? Well, it's e to the r times ln of x times the derivative of r times ln of x with respect to x, which would be r over x. Okay, what's that equal to? Well, what is e to the r times ln of x? That's just x to the r. So we have x to the r times r over x. Obviously, when I divide these two, I'm going to get x to the r minus 1. And there's our familiar power rule, except now we've proven it for any arbitrary exponent, even irrational ones such as square root of 2 or pi. All right, now that we've formally established the power rule, the next natural thing would be to ask, what is the derivative of an arbitrary exponential function? We already know that the derivative of the natural exponential function is itself the question is, what would the derivative of something like 2 to the x be, or derivative of 1 half to the x? All right, for that, we'll again use our working definition for a to the x, which is a to the x is e to the x ln of a. What's the derivative of e to the x ln of a? Well, it should be e to the x ln of a times the derivative 
of x ln of a with respect to x, which should just be ln of a. And of course, what's e to the x ln of a? That's just a to the x. So it looks like our formula for the derivative of a to the x is simply a to the x times the ln of the base. Note that this formula works when a is e. Our formula right here would say the derivative of e to the x is e to the x times the ln of e, but we know the ln of e is 1, which would give us the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, which we know is correct. All right, so here is our formula that we need for taking the derivatives of things like 2 to the x, 1 half to the x, or in general, exponential functions of any arbitrary base. So for example, just to do a couple of quick examples, um, if I said, let's take the derivative of, let's say, 3 to the x squared, the derivative would be 3 to the x squared. And remember, again, this looks like derivative with respect to x of a to the u. So of course, since that u is a function of x, I'm going to need a chain rule. The chain rule should be a to the u times ln of a times u prime. There's the chain rule. So in our problem, it should be a to the u, which would be 3 to the x squared, times ln of a, which would be ln of 3, times the derivative of that exponent, which would be the derivative of x squared. Let's try another one. Derivative with respect to x of, let's say, 10 to the sine x. Derivative should be 10 to the sine x times the ln of 10 times the derivative of the exponent. Okay, and really that's all there is to the derivative formula. It's very straightforward. It looks like the only thing we had to add over the formula we already had for the derivative e to the x was this ln of a factor that compensates for the base. All right, now that takes care of differentiation. Now we turn to integration. Well, that's pretty easy because we've already got a formula for the derivative of the exponential function. And of course, we just said that that's a to the x times ln of a. Uh, notice that's the same thing as saying 1 over the ln of a times the derivative of a to the x equals a to the x. Or to put it a different way, the derivative of a to the x over ln of a equals a to the x. So what's going to happen if I take the antiderivative of a to the x with respect to x? Well, it means I'm going to be taking the antiderivative of the derivative of a to the x over ln of a. So what is the antiderivative of a to the x with respect to x? It's the antiderivative of the derivative of a to the x ln of a. Well, what do you get when you take the antiderivative of the derivative of something? You get the something. In this case, that would be a to the x over ln of a. And that should make sense to you. If taking the derivative of a to the x gives you an answer that has a factor of ln of a in it, then when I go backwards to integrate a to the x, I'm going to divide by ln of a instead of multiplying by it. So for example, 
this formula would say if I wanted to integrate, uh, let's say, 3 to the 7x, I would treat that exponent as the u, which of course means du is 7dx. So I'd do my usual inserting of a factor of 7 and compensating by dividing by 7 outside the integral. And so now this definitely looks like 1 7th times the integral of 3 to the u du. Okay, what's my formula above? It says if I have the integral of a to the x with respect to x, the answer should be a to the x over ln of a. So the answer to this integration should be 1 7th times 3 to the u, which is 7x, over ln of a, which is ln of 3. Let's try another one. Let's try the integral of square root of 2 to the 3x. Of course, I know the square root of 2 to the 3x equals 2 to the 3x to the 1 half, which means the exponential function I'm actually looking at is 2 to the 3x over 2. So this integral really does look like a 2 to the u, where u is 3x over 2, which means du is 3 halves dx, which means I need to insert a 3 halves so that I have my du. But if I'm going to insert a 3 halves, it means on the outside of the integral, I'm going to have to multiply by 2 thirds. And now I have 2 thirds times the integral of 2 to the u du, which should be 2 thirds times 2 to the u over ln 2, because that's our formula. And now I just resubstitute u. So this should be 2 thirds times 2 to the 3x over 2 over ln 2 plus c. It's OK to leave the answer this way, but if you were to look in the back of the book, uh, just be used to seeing different looking answers for some of these integrals. Uh, for example, when I multiply these two together, you should notice that I'm going to get 2 to the 3x over 2 plus 1. When I multiply the denominators, of course, I'm going to get 3 times ln 2, but notice that's really ln of 2 cubed. That's using the power rule to pull the 3 back up here and make it an exponent on the 2 which means really that denominator becomes ln of 8. If you were to check the back of the book for a problem such as this, this is probably how they would choose to write the answer. Okay, not too bad. That takes care of derivatives and integrals of exponential functions. Fairly straightforward. Okay, now we turn to logarithms. Okay, we know that y equals a to the x is 1 to 1. Okay, since it's 1 to 1, we know that any exponential function of any base has an inverse. Okay, so given an exponential function of a particular base a, 
let's call the inverse for that exponential function the log function base a of x. So the subscript, as you'll recall from college algebra, indicates the base. So for example, if I said f of x was the exponential function base 2, the inverse of that would be the log function base 2. Notice that if the exponential function was the natural exponential function, we're saying the inverse would be the log base e function, but our special notation for that is ln for natural log. What's another common log that you might remember from, say, college algebra or chemistry? If you construct the exponential function base 10, the inverse for that function will be the log base 10 of x function. But we usually call that log, and notice I'm leaving that blank where that subscript would go. So it's customary, and you remember this if you've had chemistry, that when I write LOGX with no base indicated in that subscript, it implies that I mean base 10. So LOGX is shorthand for log base 10 of X. And this is what we call the common log. And if you remember from chemistry, uh, you, you know why the base 10 log is so useful. All right, so just a special notation for that log. Okay, let's take a minute to look at the graphs of the log functions. So, for example, here's the graph of a typical looking exponential growth function. The example I've chosen there is 2 to the x. So you notice 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half, 2 to the negative 2 is 1 fourth. Okay, the great part is using the reflective property of inverses over the line y equals x, we know that the graph of the inverse of this exponential function should have points whose coordinates are the coordinates of this exponential function, but flipped. So for example, if I take the point 1, 2 on the graph of the exponential function, then the point 2, 1 should appear on the graph of the log base 2 function. If the point 2, 4 is on the graph of the exponential function, the point 4, 2 should be on the graph of the log base 2 function. So if I plot a few of those points and then connect the graph, then of course what I see is an exact reflection over the line y equals x. And what I have there, of course, is the log base 2 function. Notice that if we were dealing with base e, uh, this comports with what we already had in mind for the pictures of e to the x and ln of x. It's got the same appearance, it's just that the graph is going to be slightly stretched or shrunken depending on what base I switch to. But the important part is, if the base is bigger than 1, then it's still going to look like this for an exponential growth function. It's still going to look like this for its inverse, which would be a log growth function. So base E and base 2 would both have this same basic appearance. Okay, what would happen if I looked at this function? Well, this would be something like log base 1 half of x. I'm sorry, 1 half to the x, the exponential function 1 half to the x. Uh, 1 half to the 0 is 1. 1 half to the 1 is 1, one half. 1 half raised to the second power is 1 fourth. 1 half raised to the negative 1 power is 2. 
1 half raised to the negative 2 power is 4. Okay, notice of course that 1 half to the x is the reflection of 2 to the x over the y-axis. And that of course is because 1 half to the x is the same thing as 2 to the minus x. We know 2 to the minus x is a reflection of 2 to the x over the y-axis. So here's a typical looking exponential decay function. And this is what our exponential function would look like if this a was a number between 0 and 1. Okay, what happens if I take these points and I reflect them over the x-axis? Then I get these points. If I connect them, then of course I see this graph. And if you look carefully, the pink graph is a reflection of the green graph over the line y equals x. Notice that the graph of this log function is a reflection of that graph. So there's all kinds of symmetries in these pictures when you compare log functions and exponential functions. The reflection property we're seeing now is that the log function where the base is less than 1 is a reflection over the x-axis of the log function of the reciprocal of that base. That is, in our example, the purple one is log base 2 of x. The pink graph is log base 1 half of x. Okay, but in terms of general behavior, what we're saying is exponential functions whose bases are less than 1 have this appearance, and they are exponential decay functions. Their inverses would be log decay functions. So the log base a of x, where a is less than 1, will look like this sort of graph. And notice again, that is the reflection of the log growth function of the reciprocal of that base. Okay, so let's think about how we can come up with something useful that actually describes a general log base a function. And it won't be too hard to do that. If I were to look at y equals log base a of x, we understand that's the same thing as saying a to the y equals x. Notice what would happen if I took the ln of both sides of that equation. I could certainly pull the y down in front and make it a multiplier. Which makes y equal to ln of x over ln of a. More generally, if I did the same thing, that is if I took a to the y equals ln of x, I'm sorry, a to the y equals x, and let's say I took the log base b of both sides, Okay, again, if I have log base b of a to the y, that exponent y can be pulled down in front of the log so that I have y times log base b of a equals log base b of x, which means y is equal to log base b of x divided by log base b of a. And this last formula that I just wrote here says that log base a of x is equal to log base b of a 
over log base b of x. So notice the x is going to go here and the a is going to go here. In other words, this formula is saying I can convert log base a of x, where a is any base, to log base a of x over log base a, I'm sorry, log base b of a, where b is any other base. So for example, if I said, let's look at log base 2 of, let's say, x, I could say that's log base 3 of x over log base 3 of 2. Or I could say this is equal to log base 10 of x over log base 10 of 2. And that should be a 2 right there. Or I could write this as log base, let's say, 72 of x over log base 72 of 2. So do you see what the formula is saying? The x is always in the top. The 2 is always in the bottom. And of course, the 2 came from this base that I was converting from. And then what am I doing in each of these ratios? I'm using a log of a common base. So in this first one, it's logs base 3, logs base 10, logs base 72. Notice that if I did this for log base e, I could write log base e of x over log base e of 2. But what is log base e? It's just the ln. Okay, so what I proved up here is just a special case of this formula. It's the special case where B is equal to Euler's number. Now, this general version I don't think he mentions in your book, in your book but you might remember that being mentioned in college algebra. Except the one you always used was really this one. Okay, why? Because in college algebra, when they asked you to evaluate something like log base 4 of 20, which of course would be what number do you raise 4 to to get 20? Well, it should be 2 point something, since 4 squared is 16 and 4 cubed is 64. The answer should be 2 point something where the decimal part should put me much closer to 2 than to 3. Well, in your calculator, you could just say log base 4 of 20 is ln of 20 over ln of 4. And that's using this formula. Okay, why is that handy? Because your calculator has an ln key, a natural log key. So you could just go into your calculator and type in ln of 20 divided by ln of 4. And that will give you your answer, log base 4 of 20. Okay, you might remember from college algebra that this log base a of x equals log base b of x over log base b of a was a formula they called the change of base formula. And we don't really call it that here in this textbook. In fact, the one we really want is just that basic formula that converts log base A of x into an expression in terms of natural logs. So the one we really want here is this one. Notice immediately this change of base formula that expresses log base A of x in terms of natural logs gives me an immediate way to find the derivative of the log function. What's the derivative of log base a of x? Well, it should be the derivative of ln of x over ln of a. ln of a is just a constant 
So this should just be the derivative with respect to x of, let's look at it this way, 1 over ln of a, which is a constant, times ln x. What's the derivative of ln of x? Well, we recall from previous section, the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. Okay, that means the derivative of log base a of x is 1 over ln of a times 1 over x, or 1 over x times ln of a. That might actually make sense to you if you think about what happened when we were taking the derivative of and integrating exponential functions. In fact, let's put this all together now. On the previous page, we said that the derivative of a to the x was a to the x times ln of a. We said the antiderivative of a to the x was a to the x divided by ln of a. Now we're saying the derivative of the log base a function is 1 over x times ln of a, but in the denominator, which means I'm really dividing by ln of a. All right, so notice I have a derivative formula for the exponential function. I have an antiderivative formula for the exponential function. I have a derivative formula for the log base a of function. Now one thing is for sure, this last one definitely says that the antiderivative of 1 over x times the ln of a with respect to x is log base a of x. Okay, what I don't get out of this formula is something that tells me how to integrate log base a of x. If I think about what that is, log base a of x we just said was ln of x over ln of a, which would be 1 over ln of a times the integral of ln of x. And if you think about it for a moment, nothing we've laid out anywhere here gives me a way to determine the antiderivative of ln of x. I can't back up any of these derivative formulas that I already had in such a way that I can find the antiderivative of just plain ln of x. We'll get to that in the next chapter. So the one thing that's going to be missing from this story is how do I take the antiderivative of the natural log function. And if I don't know how to take the antiderivative of the natural log function, I'm not going to know how to take the derivative of the log base a function either right now. So let's just say in chapter 6, what we're going to be able to do is take the derivative of exponential functions, the antiderivative of exponential functions, the derivative of log functions. The one thing that's going to be missing is antiderivatives of log functions. And we'll get to that in chapter 7. This means, of course, that taking derivatives of log functions should be pretty easy. It's just following a formula. If I said, let's take the derivative of, oh, let's try log base 3 of 5x plus 2. Okay, my formula says that should be what? It should be 1 over 5x plus 2. And don't forget now, there should be a factor in your denominator consisting of the ln of the base. Whatever the base was in your log, an ln of that base should appear in the denominator of your derivative. Okay, what's the other thing that appears in derivative? It's the u. What's the one last thing that's missing? I need the derivative of that u with respect to x which in this case would be the derivative of 5x plus 2, which would be 5. In other words, what we're saying is the chain rule version for log base a of u is what? It's u prime over u times ln of a. 
That's the general chain rule version for derivative of log base A of U. So our answer here would be 5 over ln3 times 5x plus 2. Okay, now we could certainly talk about derivatives like, let's say derivatives of log base 2 of 2x plus 3 over the cube root of 5x plus 1. And I have a formula for that right above me, right here. But of course, when I look at this, the first thing I should be thinking is all of those properties that we knew before for the natural log. That is, the log of a quotient being equal to the difference of the logs of the numerator and denominator in that quotient. Do all of those properties still apply when I change to a log of an arbitrary base? In other words, if I take the log base A of cap A over cap B, is that log base A of big A minus log base A of big B? And the answer is yes. Okay, think about it. I should be able to prove all of these properties from my basic properties for the natural log. Think about log base A of A over B, and I know that the log base A of big A over big B is the ln of A over B over the ln of A. That's using my formula that says the log base A of U is ln of u over ln of a. Okay, now what is that? That's just 1 over ln of a times the ln of a over b. ln of a over b, I can apply the quotient to directly because it's just a natural log, which means this is 1 over ln of a times ln big A minus ln big B. If I redistribute the ln of little a, I get ln big A over ln little a minus ln b over ln little a. Okay, but if I use the quotient rule in reverse, I know that this is simply log base a of a, and I know the second term is log base a of b. And that definitely says that log base A of A over B, big A over big B, is the difference of the logs of those numbers in the numerator and denominator. So let's just say, um, fact, the three, The three log properties, or let's say ln properties, hold for log base A as well. That is the product property, the quotient property, and the power property. Okay, so if I look at that problem that I didn't really finish, this one here, here I'll go to the next page and I, I may change the numbers a little bit. And one of those numbers might be a little different, but that's, that's close enough. All right, so what that means is to take the derivative, we want to exploit our log properties just like we did before. So I would say this is log base 2 of 2x plus 3 minus 1 third log base 2 of 5x plus 1. Notice where I'm getting the 1 third from. I'm definitely saying this is log base 2 of 2x plus 3 minus log base 2 of 5x plus 1 to the 1 third. And then I'm pulling that one third down using the exponent property, the power rule. 
Now if I want to take the derivative, I can just apply my new formula directly. The derivative of log base 2 of u should be u prime over u times the ln of a, or the ln of the base, which in this case is 2, minus 1 third times, uh, same, same rule, u prime, which is 5, over u, which is 5x plus 1, times the log of the base, which again is ln of 2. Um, there isn't much to do there other than to say this is 2 over 2x plus 3 times ln 2 minus 5 over, let's say, 5x plus 1 times 3 ln 2. Notice that 3 ln 2 could be written as ln of 8. So if I wrote that as ln of 8, about the only other thing I could do to clean this up would be to multiply top and bottom by the factors necessary to get common denominators. I don't think that's really very important for this one, but just notice it means that for this first one, I would simply have to multiply top and bottom of that fraction by 5x plus 1 times ln 8. And I'd have to multiply top and bottom of this one by 2x plus 3 times ln 2. And honestly, that doesn't get you very much or get you anything that's very useful. So for any question that I would ask you, that answer right there is, is plenty far enough. Okay, that takes care of derivatives. And again, we can exploit all those log properties just like we could when we were taking derivatives of the natural log function. Now, this brings us to something new that we haven't seen before. Um, and again, we're going to use logarithmic differentiation to do this. But here's the kind of function I want to look at now. Let's say my function was something like um, ln of x raised to the sine x. Okay, notice um, this is neither an exponential function or a polynomial function. You know, if I think about what an exponential function looks like, a basic exponential function looks like a constant raised to a variable. If I flip that around and do x squared, I know that's a polynomial graph. I mention those two because in the first function, you see that the variables in the, in the exponent and for a polynomial function, the variable is in the base. So that's really the essential difference between a monomial and an exponential function. It's where's the variable? Is it in the exponent or is it in the base? Notice this function I have here has variables in both the base and the exponent. So this is definitely not a polynomial term, and it's definitely not an exponential function. Okay, the upshot there is our usual formulas, that is the power rule for polynomial terms, and the exponential rule that we just came up with, neither one of these applies to this function. Make sure you understand that. This function I've given you in this example is not an exponential function and it's not of polynomial form. That means neither of these derivative formulas that we know for those pure functions applies to this, let's call it mixed function. that has got a little bit of variable in the base, a little bit of variable in the exponent. That means to find the derivative of something like this, we're going to do something different. And actually what we're going to do is logarithmic differentiation. So if I apply the process of logarithmic differentiation, you know that means that we take the log, natural log of both sides. Okay, and again, if you remember what happens generally in the process of logarithmic differentiation, 
the, the thing that made it work and all the examples we looked at previously is that when you take the log of this expression on the right side of the equation, it allows you to use the power property to pull that exponent down in front of this log on the outside and make it a multiple. Which means in this example, I would have ln of y equals sine x times the ln of the ln of x. Now, let's take the derivative. What's the derivative on the left side? Well, what's the derivative of ln of u? We keep saying it's u prime over u. That's if u is a function of x. Well, y is a function of x, so the chain rule says that when I take the derivative of ln of y, I should get y prime over y. Okay, what's the left side going to be? Well, the left side is definitely a product. It's a product of those two functions, which means I'll use a product rule. Derivative of sine x is cosine x. Leave the second factor alone. Plus, for the second part of the product rule, leave the first function alone then take the derivative of the second factor, which is the ln of the ln of x. Okay, be careful there. This definitely looks like an ln of u. And I know the derivative of that should be u prime over u. Okay, in this case, we're saying the u is this ln of x. So the derivative should be the derivative of ln of x, which is 1 over x, over u, which is ln of x. Okay, what does that give me? It gives me y prime over y is equal to cosine x times the ln of the ln of x plus sine x over x ln of x. Okay, what's y prime? Because we're still trying to solve for y prime. Well, to get y prime by itself on the left side of the equation here, I should just multiply by y. If I do that, I get y prime equals all that stuff in the red parentheses. times y, but what's y? y is just the original function. Okay, what this means is when you use this process on a function like this, your final answer for the derivative is always going to contain the function you started with. It's going to be the function you started with, which is the y, times this other part. And that other part is coming from where? It's coming from a product of this function, the one that you pulled down, times the ln of the function that was in the base to start with. Let's do another one of these. Actually, let's do a, a fun one, a kind of strange one. And I doubt you've seen one like this before because we're not equipped to talk about functions like this in Calc 1. So we call this usually a tower function. Actually, some books would call it a power tower. Now, if you notice, uh, if you're confused about how to read that, let's put some numbers in there for a second. Suppose I said 2 to the 3 to the 4. And if I asked you to evaluate that, the thing you'd have to figure out is, should I be reading that from the bottom, that is the 2, or should I be reading it from the top where the 4 is? Well, if you read it from the bottom, it means I suppose you'd be thinking about doing the 2 cubed first. And if you did it that way, that would get you 8, and then you would take 8 to the 4th. Okay, notice if you read it that way, that would be the same thing as doing that. 
because the parentheses would say to do the 2 cubed first, then to take that answer and raise it to the fourth. Okay, this is not the meaning of this 2 to the 3 to the 4 because I've already got a very standard algebraic way or way from college algebra that we've learned to write this expression if that's what I meant. So when I'm reading one of these towers, where I start is from the top, not from the bottom. So if I was asking you what 2 to the 3 to the 4th is, first I would evaluate 3 to the 4th, which is 81, and the answer would be 2 to the 81. And that's definitely not the same thing as 8 to the 4th. Uh, notice what 8 to the 4th is. 8 to the 4th is that 2 cubed to the 4th, and that would be 2 to the 12th. And that's a completely different thing than 2 to the 81. So when you see one of these so-called towers, that is something raised to something raised to something, always start from the top and work your way down. So what does it mean in this case where all three are x's? Well, it simply means I would evaluate x to the x, and then whatever that is, I would raise x to that value. Okay, more importantly though, uh, for this example, what I want to ask is, what is the derivative of this thing? Okay, now again, since this does look like x to another function of x, that's my cue to use logarithmic differentiation. So I'm going to start out by taking the log of both sides. And I just have to remember when I do this that the exponent on that function in this log on the right side of the equation is actually x to the x. Which means when I use my power property to pull that exponent down, what I'm going to get is ln of y equals x to the x times ln x. What happens when I take the derivative of both sides of the equation now? Well, again, it's a product on the right side. So when I take the derivative, I should get y prime over y equals the derivative of x to the x. We'll figure that out in a second. Times, leave the second factor alone, plus leave the first factor alone, times the derivative of the second factor, which is the derivative of ln of x. All right, now, that leaves us with the question, what is the derivative of x to the x? Well, if I said y was equal to x to the x, do you see that I need logarithmic differentiation again to figure out what that derivative is? ln of y equals ln of x to the x. That means ln of y equals x times ln of x when I use the power property. Now if I take the derivative, I'm going to get y prime over y equals derivative of the first, which is 1, times ln x, plus x times the derivative of ln of x which is 1 over x. So actually what I get there is y prime over y equals ln of x plus 1 because this guy is just x times 1 over x. So what's the derivative of x to the x? It's ln x plus 1 times y. But remember, y is just x to the x. So y prime is ln x plus 1 times x to the x. That means when I come back up here, y prime over y is the derivative of x to the x, which is ln x plus 1 times x to the x times ln x, and that's coming from right here, plus 
x to the x times 1 over x. Okay, but that means when I find y prime, that's going to be what? ln x plus 1 times x to the x times ln x plus x to the x times 1 over x. All of that times y, and what was y? y was originally x to the x to the x. Okay, don't look for nice simplifications on the derivatives of weird functions like this. They're just not going to be nice. There are various things you could do to clean this up, but whatever you do, it's not going to look nice. There's just too many weird functions involved here. So this would be fine for anything that you would do online or paper homework. Okay, I think that's probably a good place to stop. That gives you a couple of good examples of taking derivatives of these, uh, let's call them pseudo-exponential functions, where you have to exploit this logarithmic differentiation technique. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and in particular, if you get stuck on any of these logarithmic differentiation problems involving these kinds of functions. Let me know.